Public dialogue and civic engagement are important. They play a role in improving the health and well-being of Texans across our great state. That's why Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to support Texas Tribune conversations like the one you're about to see. Let me introduce a terrific panel, really a superlative panel, to talk about this incredibly important issue of health care. All of you who work in the public policy space in Texas know that in this biennium, for the first time ever, health care has risen to exceed education in the all-fund state budget. It is the number one line item in the state budget. We continue to have the most people in the state without health insurance. Uh, we have a huge challenge on our hands in terms of health care in a population that is growing quickly and changing dynamically. And who better than these four to help us talk about the series of issues around the transformation of Texas hospitals in this, uh, 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 in, in this environment. Let me begin with George Massey on my immediate left, who is president and CEO of Harris Health System a $1.3 billion public entity with 23 community health centers, five school-based clinics, a dental center, a dialysis center, mobile health units, a rehabilitation and specialty hospital, and two full-service hospitals. Previously, he spent 10 years as the system's executive vice president and chief operating officer. Before that, another four as the administrator for Harris Health Ben Taub Hospital. He served for 27 years as a career officer with the Army Medical Department rising to the rank of Colonel on tomorrow's Veterans Day. Thank you very much for your service, Colonel Massey. He has graduate degrees from the University of Buffalo, from Long Island University, and the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Uh, the person who gets the longest commute award today is Israel Rocha to Colonel Massey's left. He is CEO of Doctors Hospital at Renaissance, a 530-bed general acute care hospital in Edinburgh down in the Rio Grande Valley with more than 650 physicians, more than 1,200 nurses, and more than 70 specialties and subspecialties. He has been in that post for a little bit less than two years. He previously spent more than four years as doctor's, do doctor's hospital's government, public, and corporate affairs officer. He is also executive director of the Hospital Coalition of South Texas. Before entering the private sector, Mr. Rocha worked for 10 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he was deputy chief of staff for and legislative director for Congressman Ruben Hinojosa. Mr. Rocha is a graduate of Columbia University. On his left is Debbie Sukin, who is regional senior vice president of Houston Methodist, responsible for three suburban hospitals, and is CEO of Houston Methodist, the Woodlands Hospital, a 193-bed facility set to open still in 2017. Previously, she served as senior vice president of CHI St. Luke's Health System, likewise responsible for three hospitals, and was CEO of CHI St. Luke's, the Woodlands Hospital, for more than 10 years. Dr. Sukin has an undergraduate degree from Mary Baldwin College in Virginia, a master's in health administration from the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and a PhD from the University of Texas Health Science Center here in Houston. Finally, John Warner, Dr. John Warner, CEO of University Hospitals at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. He previously served as Assistant Vice President for Hospital Planning, where he was instrumental in the design and planning of the William P. Clements Jr. University Hospital, less than a year old, right. right? An interventional cardiologist, he's been based since 2003 at UT Southwestern, where he completed his residency in internal medicine and served as chief resident. Dr. Warner has an undergraduate degree from Abilene Christian University, a medical degree from the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and an MBA from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you all so much. Dr. Sukin, let me begin with you. So March of next year, we will celebrate, celebrating quotes, depending upon your perspective, the sixth anniversary of President Obama signing the Affordable Care Act into law. Will it be the kind of celebration commemorated with cake and balloons from the hospital perspective, or will it be more like the anniversary of a tragedy, armbands and we will not forget? What will the disposition <laughs> of the hospital community be uh, about the Affordable Care Act when that anniversary comes around, good or bad? Well, with great enthusiasm, it will be neither. It will be neither. <laughs> it will be neither. Right. Um, I do not believe it will be uh, celebrated with balloons and cake, but I also think that um, uh, it won't be uh, the end of time as well. I yeah. think that um, it, it purely just provided a starting point. And I right. think that it, there are many parts of it yep. um, that those of us would say uh, didn't work and they would never have worked. 
Um, you would have said at the beginning before correct. it never would have worked. Correct. Right. And I think there are parts of it that we would say it's a good starting point. Right. Um, Has it materially changed your life as an executive at a, a big hospital or series of hospitals? It has not materially changed our life, but I, I will say that I think it did accelerate the focus on uh, several things. One is our whole pay for performance and focus on quality uh, with regard to how we were going to approach, um, uh, particularly, uh, I think, working with the physicians. And so yep. for those in the world of private practice, I think it has changed, um, uh, I think, a perspective. Uh, for for some, not yep. for all, for some, um, and we're beginning to see that that change. Um, I also think that uh, in looking at the impact that it has had, uh, particularly on the focus less on what happens inside the four walls of a hospital, and really I think beginning to push what was uh, I think clearly we thought of as hospital systems yep. to truly uh, maybe not redefining but more of a focus on developing the health system and looking at that continuum yeah. uh, from that perspective. Well, this is about transformation today, so that's maybe one, right. one road there. Uh, Mr. Rocha, stipulating that you came out of democratic politics, take your political <laughs> hat off, <laughs> put your hospital hat on. You're in, a, uh, you're in a part of the state that is growing very quickly, changing dynamically. Um, you know, not all that different from Houston, maybe on a smaller scale, there are a lot of similarities, but the reality is you've got your own set of challenges in the Valley. Has the, the time under the Affordable Care Act been a positive or a negative from your perspective in the, in the chair in which you sit? You know, I think it's, it's been a little bit of both. I think that you, we have some real serious challenges with the disproportionate share funding clauses that were done. Yep. Um, we have some challenges with some mic work. I want to be sure that your mic is, be, let's be sure that your mic is turned on. Can you all hear? No, okay. Maybe click that little switch and let's see. How's that? That's your Check right now. Better? All right. Is okay. that better? So let me, let me ask it again, and we'll just pretend sure. we never heard the first part. Um, <laughs> uh, how, how has the Affordable Care Act uh, changed your life from the perspective of somebody who runs a, a, a fairly significant hospital in the Valley? I, I think there's been a lot of challenges that the Affordable Care Act has brought forward. Uh, very important for our community and for Texas at large have been the changes to the disproportionate share program, both in Medicare and Medicaid. I think the, the, the rate of reduction that has been um, allocated in that program, it was a big portion of the savings that was passed in Affordable Care Act, has really put a lot of hospitals in, at risk. In the Rio Grande Valley, we used to have about eight locally owned hospitals. In that time, that has been cut down to two. Uh, two of them closed out right, and four of them got sold, and then two of them got resold again. And you directly attribute that back to the changing economics of health care over the last six years? I think it's been a very serious challenge for hospitals that rely heavily on Medicare and Medicaid. Right. If you have been innovative and have right. stayed ahead of the game and making sure that you're keeping uh, track with innovation and, and pay for performance and quality measures, um, you could have survived that change. If, if you right. were not on top of it, it really could have caused some financial hardship for your right. hospital. Uh, Colonel Massey, you, you, you know, you're the county guy. We, what we hear over the last few years is that the county folks, judges and others, wish that a state like Texas, which has refused steadfastly to embrace the Affordable Care Act, would do so enthusiastically. County judges all said to the governor, we want you to uh, take our advantage of the opportunity to expand uh, Medicaid. From your particular perspective, it may be a different conversation than the one we're having with Dr. Sukin and Mr. Rocha. Well, to, to harken back to your metaphor about the celebra celebration party, yeah. uh, it's a celebratory event uh, as we look back on the Affordable Care Act having been signed into law, but it's a muted celebration because everybody who should have been invited to the party was not invited. How's that? Well, um, the, 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 the Affordable Care Act was implemented in pieces. A very important piece that was not actualized for Texas is expansion of Medicaid. Right. And so um, the, the rules of engagement by the federal government in the form of CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, was that uh, we are offering states the opportunity to expand Medicaid. Here to forefront compensated care for, for care that was not funded, uh, the federal government, state governments, through a, a very sort of complicated formula, provided funds to offset those expenses called yeah. UC, uncompensated care. So the rules of engagement were by the federal government, here's Medicaid to be expanded. We hope you'll take it. By the way, we're not printing new money in Washington. Yeah. The dollars that will go to support Medicaid expansion will come from this pile of money that's called UC. Right. So we expect that you would be willing to take the money. 
Texas said no. And if you don't take the money, tough the, luck. And the UC dollars will continue to be constricted. Right. So today in Harris County, which is my area of That's my, my catchment area, uh, we still have close to 1 million uninsured people. Right. Total population 4.7 million. Right. Okay. 1 million uninsured. More than 20 percent. 22 percent. Yeah. And so those folks have not been invited to come to the party. Uh, what is more profound, and that and that has put a strain most definitely on your system. Well, for for Harris Health, yeah. had we been able to ensure the 70,000 patients who would be eligible for Medicaid expansion, that would have been 100 million dollars in revenue that we would have been able to benefit from to access it, it insured right. patients, yeah. uh, bring revenue that we can use not to not to do anything but expand more care to take yeah. care of more people. Right. So for us, it's it's a muted celebration. Uh, the pieces are in play, but we've not been able to take advantage it's of it. It's an unleveraged them. opportunity on, yeah. on, in many respects. Uh, Dr. Warner, you're in a situation different from your three uh, 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 fellow panelists here. Uh, what would you say, from your perspective, has been the most uh, consequential impact on your work and on the UT Southwestern Medical Center, and specifically in the last year on the Clemens Hospital of the Affordable Care? Well, well in the, uh, I would echo the comments made by other panelists in terms of both the positives and the negatives. Yeah. But I think one thing it has done is accelerate the uh, transparency and accountability piece of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And yep. certainly the hospitals are, I now think, facing forward on that issue more because we're being held financially accountable, not only for the outcomes in the hospital, but right. also the outcomes that might occur immediately after your discharge from the hospital. So it has changed our approach about that. So that, that's a positive in many ways, and I think the conversation has been accelerated, but it's also a challenge for all of us because there are things that are beyond our control um, in the, in the, within the four walls of the hospital there. It's also, I think, led to a different conversation with patients. Um, these high deductible plans now, um, people are paying more out of pocket money for healthcare. And right. so they're shopping for value and we're being forced to, to have a different conversation um, with people that are, instead of just taking what their primary care physician or their neighbor recommends, they're on the internet, they're looking at things and they're right. asking us, what are, you know, why does this cost this much? And you know, are you gonna do a good job with my procedure? And uh, what's the follow up look like? And, well, What's out out in the real world, we call that customer service. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. probably not a that's probably not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. And one wonders why there wasn't more customer service perhaps yeah. before. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, in addition to the folks that are that are not being covered appropriately for the the, the uh, by Medicaid expansion, that sort of thing, there's also I think a new working poor, which is the you know, someone making between forty and sixty thousand dollars a year that has this very high deductible plan, right. and you know, for a five thousand dollars to someone making that kind of money, might as well be five hundred thousand dollars in terms yeah. of uh, in terms of what. So there's the uninsured, but then there's also the underinsured or Absolutely. the insufficiently insured. It's Correct. a larger problem than maybe the numbers that Colonel Massey alluded to. We know there are four point seven million who have no insurance. It's a number that's down since the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, got into effect, thanks in no part to Texas. But the reality is there may be many more people who don't have access to adequate insurance. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Warner and, and Dr. Sukin, you just built and you are building a hospital in this modern era. In the post-ACA era, you're building new facilities. Dr. Warner, is, are the decisions that go into how you think about this facility different as a result of the ACA? And I want to ask you the same thing, yeah. uh, Dr. Sukin. Yeah, I think, you know, you really have to look at what's occurring in the hospital because it's not just the care that you're delivering. You're also educating right. and, and building a platform of health for that patient as they leave the hospitals. So that's something that's, that can be awkward to deliver in the, uh, in the environment of the hospital. So you have to build that into the architecture. You know, length of stays are short now. People are not in the hospital for very long. You have a lot to get done while they're in the hospital. So you have to have a team that really focuses and uses every minute, not only to educate them about their acute illness, but to begin to solve their healthcare needs for the yep. continuum as well. And I think as, as someone who's just opened a hospital 11 months ago, I, you know, the things where we've really done well and succeeded in it when we built that geography. I always tell people the two lessons we learned are listen to patients along the way. Let them help you tell you what the hospital should look like and what they need. Yeah. And the second lesson is geography matters. If you're gonna be a team, you have to build a hospital that's built for a team. They have to have adjacencies and places you, you to mean do that work. Physically, physically, it's physically be, yeah. physical geography. Right. It's not enough to say you're going to do it. You have to actually program it into the architecture yeah. itself. Dr. Sukin, if we were having this conversation 10 years ago, and you were, I mean, obviously a lot of other things have changed in 10 years, but let's put those to the side. In the pre-ACA era, would you be building a different hospital than you're building now? 
know, I think you would be building somewhat of a different hospital, but you would still be building a hospital. So right. the population, we're fortunate enough to be in the great state of Texas where their economic development is alive and well, right. and population is growing. So I think that's number one. Uh, I think what's important is um, the expectations over the last decade have continued to be customer focused, and quite frankly, with the competition um, and, and the continued growth, um, this whole idea of private rooms, that's the expectation. Go back further than that 20, 30 years ago, we obviously had semi-private rooms. The reimbursement did not change during that time period, so we have set an expectation. I'll go one step further from and, the and who's bearing the economic responsibility of the change We're in expectation? We're all bearing the economic. We're all bearing it. We're all bearing the economic. Right. What I will tell you that has improved, and it's by looking at other industry, is this constant look at how do we use technology to innovate the processes. So I'll give you an example. We used to build, if you all recall, large waiting rooms. You can go into probably hospitals um, very, very close to here where you will see football fields, quite frankly, right. of waiting rooms. That is not how we're building them for the future. The expectation from our consumer, and we always say there's an app for everything, you want it today, you want it now, yep. is how do we use the technology, just as an example, to improve those processes um, to come to the hospital, whether it be a physician's office that's scheduling an appointment, or yep. whether, and actually doing an admission, or whether it's the patient. So it's this whole idea of think about that space shrinking. Um, I can go back 20 years ago when we were building hospitals where we used to have truly basements full for materials, and then you remember we learned from industry and we all went to just-in-time inventory. Yep. It's those innovations that get built into, and you have the opportunity with new processes, new technologies yeah. to be able to change really how you construct. Right. Now, Colonel Massey, I heard both Dr. Warner and Dr. Sukin talk about pay for performance or outcomes-based funding. This is a conversation that happens, as you know, Dr. Warner, also on the higher ed side. Increasingly, we're talking about paying on the basis of outputs and not, and not inputs. Anything wrong with that? If that's, in fact, an innovation in this last six years and the changing conversation about healthcare, isn't that a good thing? It is a good thing. Yeah. The, the old paradigm was the more, I, the more I do, the better I do. Right. The new paradigm is the better you do, the better I do. You, the patient. Right. And so that's pa one big change. That's a huge change. Right. Uh, and and patients have developed expectations. Right. And they continue to ex develop expectations. The access to the, uh, to the to the world of computers. Yeah. Uh, Googling and, and finding out about a doctor's performance, about a hospital's performance, patient satisfaction scores. That's 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 enormously important. Will be right. more important in the future. Yeah. But it requires, uh, Mr. Rocha. It requires at least a marginally sophisticated customer to understand, first of all, these are expectations that I can have, it's okay for me to have them and to essentially demand them of the, of, of the person that they're going to, to see, whether it's a hospital or a doctor's office. Do you feel like people in your part of the state have gotten wise to this changing environment? Because obviously you've had to change, but so has the patient population had to change. You know, I think that patients are, are quickly learning how they can be able to get the best medicine for their family, and so when, people confront illness, there always is a very genuine effort that goes into researching how you can best deal with the challenges that lie ahead of you. Regardless of, of literacy barriers or challenges, they'll see yep. different inputs, whether it's friends, customers, but quality-driven medicine is definitely the wave of the future. I think it's important. I think that it has made medicine stronger. Um, you know, you asked a question about changing healthcare dynamics. You know, we also are in the process of building. I think that the future of medicine is changing. However, we're always going to confront illness until that. Yeah, this comes back to Dr. Sukin's point. Exactly. It's still about sick people and people who treat them, right? That, those are the fundamental ingredients. But I think the change in this infrastructure has changed. You've seen a lot more people. We just recently built an outpatient surgery center because you're seeing with great speed procedures that yesterday used to take, you know, three, four days right. of hospitalization done in a few hours. And we've really increased in the amount of, of, uh, of complicated healthcare we can deliver. So moving to uh, hopefully a level one trauma center, being able to do more advanced neurosurgical and orthopedic coverage. So more vert so, vertical slices, specialty yeah. facilities exactly. that might be offshoots of the of the main facility. Absolutely, and all those based on quality-driven metrics that right. you can display and tell people why you really are the best partner in healthcare. Right. I think that's the future. Uh, Colonel Massey, you talked, I can't help, my politics and public policy hat is always on. I have to ask you about the politics of healthcare, mm -hmm. not necessarily the economics uh, deriving from this conversation about the ACA or any material changes to your facilities, but the politics of it. This is a political football. Mm -hmm. Healthcare may have always been a political football in this country and in our communities, but it is an, a special political football right now. And it's a political football in election season. We're going to have a new administration in Washington in, in a year plus. 
it may very well be a political football uh, going forward. How have the politics of health care impacted the work that you do? Well, it, it's, it's, it's impacted it profoundly because uh, when you get right down to it, uh, the bottom line is the bottom line. It's, yep. it's about the dollars that are in play. And so if you take a look at the, the burden on the local taxpayer, Yep. Uh, by having this large population of uninsured. Right. Uh, and the tax, the taxpayer, by the way, gets, uh, I'm speaking for the taxpayer in Harris County now. Yeah. I call it the double whammy. What happens to the taxpayer? Well, you've already, how many of you live in Harris County? Okay, guess what? You've already paid towards that Medicaid expansion program, right? You may not realize it, but you have. Those are federal dollars that are in play. Uh, the bad news is that the money that you've contributed through your tax program has gone to other states. Yeah. So there's 31 states now, I believe, the last one having converted last week, that are taking. Was that New Montana? Montana. So Montana. Montana, New York, Connecticut, California, Arizona, among others. Right. They're celebrating the fact that we have not taken advantage of Medicaid expansion. It's particularly galling that California is getting our money. We That's don't right. hate anything in Texas as much as California. <laughs> right. Right. So here's the, here's the, here's the sec here's the second part of that whammy. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who live in Harris County and own property, you are assessed 17 cents on 100 of evaluation, right? And we're very grateful for the. $621 million that will come to Harris Health next year in tax-supported uh, su support to expand care. But you've already paid for Medicaid expansion. It's gone to other states. And you're helping Harris County with our $1.4 million billion dollar budget by contributing your tax dollars. Uh, that's politics at its very raw rawest form. I mean, it's, it's about it's about it's about dollars, leveraging dollars, and who gets to pay the bill. And it's about choices, Dr. Sukin, that we make at the voting booth, right? We elect a conservative state government. Conservative state government says we don't like the president, we don't like the Affordable Care Act, especially we're not going to expand Medicaid. The consequences of that, like them or don't like them, ultimately land in your, on your doorstep, on all of our doorsteps. Right, and I think it's significant. We're just talking about Harris County. We're lucky that we have a county hospital, and we're lucky that we have other hospitals that actually get right. some sort of state funding. Um, I can tell you in a county lot like Montgomery County. Right, you're, and you're building a hospital in South right? Montgomery I, County right exactly. now. Exactly. Right. I can tell you that it's a growing population. There is no county hospital. So I say that all the hospitals, all the hospitals are county hospitals. Right. We all have an insured, I can tell you, it's similar amounts um, yeah. that actually come up and down 45. And we have to take care of them. They pop and in, do. and the care in the emergency room is free to them, but it's not free to the rest of us, to Dr. To Colonel Massey's right. point. Right. And so the idea that our property taxes are all impacted by these uncompensated care costs being passed along at a time when we're talking about cutting property taxes in the state, in fact, it's going down over here, but it's going up right. over here to the degree that we don't. Uh, Mr. Rocha, you talked about the reimbursement <laughs> rates. There was a conversation at the state legislature during this session the House wanted to raise the re re reimbursement rate more than the Senate did. Ultimately, the Senate prevailed in the state budget. That is not a material, an immaterial decision in your world, right? No, it's not. I think one of the things that gets remiss is that healthcare is very complicated. But one of the issues is that in Texas, hospitals are by true Medicare formulary, and by that means what Medicare reimburses, hospitals actually receive only about 50% of their direct costs from the traditional Medicaid rate. Right. And that's one of the concerns we have with Medicaid expansion. Even if we expand, we will have to fix that issue because when you overlay Medicaid expansion, it only expands the rate that is paying you for traditional Medicaid. The rest of it, that 50% of cost comes from disproportionate share funding. Right. That won't get expanded with Medicaid. So even if you expand Medicaid today, hospitals will still have a challenge. Because the reimbursement rate is not, is not adequate. And Dr. Rates. Warner, in your case, you're getting it from both ends. You're getting it on the health care funding side, but you also get it on the higher ed funding right. side. Yeah. It's how, a, how are you feeling about that? Not great. Um, yeah. Better, maybe, in small bites. But, right. uh, you know, it's, there's, the, there's two pieces of this. There's expanding care. Right. There's also expanding providers. And uh, <laughs> what I really worry most about, in addition to what's already been pointed out, is not eventually if we get all this fixed we may not have enough doctors to actually provide the care because there's a big mismatch between what we're training and what we we're going to need so that right gets now to the graduate a, that gets to the graduate medical education it does. conversation yeah and you know we so we have lots of medical students um, in Texas that are going elsewhere for the residencies and i think a similar right. scenario could play out to what actually happened to me i'm as texan as they come i grew up in rural west texas i went to a west texas college i right. went you know, I went somewhere else for, I went to, did my residency at UT Southwestern, but I finished my training at Duke. And so despite, and so when you've been a training for a long time, as many doctors have, it's taken you 10 plus years to do it. By then you usually have a spouse, you usually have kids, 
and you, there's a great an amount of inertia to stay where you are. And so right. I practiced in North Carolina at Duke for three years before I came back to Texas. That happens every single day when people don't have spots to finish their training in Texas. Right. So we're turning away thousands of doctors right. who would prefer to be in Texas, but train somewhere else because we don't have the opportunities so, so available. So I, I want to come to that. That's a good pivot. Let me ask one more, and I'll come right sure. back to that in a second. Let me ask one more question about the politics of this and the ACA. The president some months ago threatened to withhold quite a bit of money from the hospitals of this state if the state did not move in the direction of Medicaid. Do you think he's bluffing, Dr. Sukin? Do you, do you all worry that there is money that you would have access to but for the state's uh, recalcitrance or intransigence on this? I mean, how, how significant do you consider this threat, these loss of dollars? I mean, I think you approach all these things as though you don't question it as, is it a bluff? You're always prepared. And I think that it gets back to really um, uh, what was already said here on the panel, which is if you're a hospital that is planning ahead, yeah. and you're a hospital that's in a position that can constantly, uh, quite frankly, be doing things of which you're already pushing the envelope to say, how can you uh, manage the health of a population better? How can you look at being more efficient, right patient, right bed, right time? Right. You know, those are things where you, you don't, it's not a question of should we, should we call the bluff or not? Um, so, so my response would be, you know, you're always, you have to be prepared. Right. That's part of running a sound business, and I'll just leave it at if that. If those monies did not come to the hospitals of the state, would it, would you, would you feel it? It'd be a tremendous impact, yeah. negatively. It would. Agree, agree? Yeah, absolutely. It would, yeah. And I would add, I don't think that it's a bluff if you look at Florida. They recently, they have a very similar structure to our 1115 waiver, and they're in litigation currently, and they lost uh, a significant right. portion of their UC funding, which, uh, was being discussed, and I think the White House means to to use every leverage that it can to force expansion. And I think that uh, when you have an uncompensated care program that provides a lot of funding to hospitals in Texas, it's a serious lever. The question that we would say is that, and has always been our plea, is take hospitals out of that political fight. If it's right. a fight between state and federal government, the hospitals and the people that the hospitals serve don't make us collateral damage. And, and of course that. And so, you can't yeah. fix Texas, I mean, you can't fix America without fixing Texas. We're such a huge proportion of the uninsured. That so. should be needlepointed on a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. In fact, I suspect there are some pillows that say that right now. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Can't fix the country without fixing Texas. There you so, go. So, yeah. Fix Texas, yeah, that's good, I get it. Very good. Um, to this question of docs and, and the graduate medical education, we did make some progress during the legislative session mm -hmm. on that issue. I thought we had enough, doc. I thought after we passed tort reform that suddenly the floodgates opened and doctor, we couldn't keep doctors away. We had to beat them back with a stick. Dr. Sukin, do I have the wrong idea about the number of doctors that we have in this state and that we still need? I think there's an incredible need. Um, yeah, talk and, about that. Is that about population growth, first and foremost? It's about population growth, but more importantly, it's a, it is about creating more residency mm -hmm. slots. And so uh, Houston Methodist, you know, there's a growing need. Uh, to be able to expand our training programs. I'm quite confident at uh, all the medical schools, as in fact, that's why we've got the conversation going around right. about creating more medical schools, because the opportunity to train more in order to be able to uh, actually populate and recruit and retain in yeah. our own state is significant. And again, I would say as we grow, just focusing on primary care physicians alone, we talk about population health, um, the, the number that we need is nowhere near, I mean, our, our ability to be able to yeah. uh, not just create the slots, but actually recruit them. Does it change the way you do business as a hospital? When you ask that question, be more specific. Well, I mean, does the, does the knowledge that you don't have enough docs and you're not likely to anytime soon, despite the good efforts of the state to increase the number of residency slots or the new medical schools coming online in Austin and the Valley, which may get to some of the problems Dr. Warner's talking about, you have to confront the reality of this. So here's what I always think about. It's less about what's happening here in the big city. When you go out into the rural areas and you think about what's their ability to recruit, they don't have the same budgets. It's yeah. difficult to recruit, quite frankly, um, to be able to recruit into some of these areas. And so that's where you get into the conversation where Texas Hospital Association, Texas Medical Association is really beginning to look at how to use mid-levels. And we've seen that. We've seen an incredible increase of nurse practitioners and mid-levels to be right. used. But as not, they but not without its controversies. That's exactly right. That subject is very controversial itself. That's right. uh, you, you shake your head. You don't have enough docs. Well, Yes and yes, but so if, if you take the, the way the way we, we frame it, in the discussion when we, we talk with our colleagues is that now I have I have three hospitals in my system. Yes. When patients access the hospital, it's oftentimes because of a systems failure. 
Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that if, if a patient suffers blunt trauma in an auto accident, there's very little choice involved with that. But if you think about, a lot of people know about Ben Taub Hospital, for example, because it's a level one trauma center. Yes. If we toured Ben Taub this morning or tomorrow or the next day, I'd be able to show you that there's 17% of the workload in the emergency center is trauma. The rest of the workload in that emergency center are elderly patients with congestive heart failure, diabetes, pneumonias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Those are systems failures, meaning if we had enough access to primary care to intersect the disease in the early stages, the diabetic would have access to insulin and not have the below the knee amputation. Yeah. Uh, the CHF patient would be managed in the home as, a, as opposed to being on pulmonary service in the hospital. Yep. And it goes on like that. So hospitals are the nexus of cost. So if you want to see an expensive operation, go look at a hospital. hospital right. Emergency rooms, operating rooms, pennies on the dollar in terms of what you can do to intersect disease and, and illness on the front end with good primary care intervention. So in many ways, in many ways, our system is in, in, in balance. And so that's part, that's, part, that's part of the discussion we have to have going forward also. How do these scarce dollars get allocated? How do we yeah. use the dollars that are made available to us to improve population? You, you buy Dr. Warner's point that with more graduate medical education opportunities, residency slots and what have you, that the pipeline will widen and that will help solve some of your problems? Absolutely. You're pushing for the University of Houston to do what it's talking about doing in terms of a medical school? I am. You are. I'm supportive. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rocha, you're living in a community that is about to get finally a medical school, and there's been calls from the Valley for how long? Nobody pays attention to us in this way, and we're underserved, and now you think maybe this will be, this will solve some of the problem. Well, I, I think that it is definitely, we've seen a, a very big difference in our ability to recruit physicians from around the country. We used to have the hardest time to recruit specialists. And since our medical school has come on board and, and we've been having much better luck in recruiting key specialties that we need. And then also, as they talked about, most residents stay within 60 miles of where they complete their residency training. Right. So we hope that works. However, you know, the challenge for physicians isn't just about what is happening today. The other challenge is that you're getting ready to see a very large number of the specialists that we have in this country retire and we haven't kept pace with the growth of population and expanding additional capacity in those specialties. And those specialties, unfortunately, take 10, 12 years to replace. Right. And we're not graduating the numbers that we need to be able to address tomorrow's increase in population. So we have a lot of set of challenges yep. that I think medical schools alone and residencies will not address unless we continue to increase those numbers. It'll help, but it won't be enough. It won't be but enough. Let me stay with you, Mr. Rocha, and ask about demographics. You know my favorite subject. There's nothing I like more about uh, than a conversation about population politics and policy uh, intersecting. 27 million people in the state. We are a minority majority state. Within the next 20 years, according to Steve Murdoch down the street, we will be majority Hispanic. By 2050, the state's population will double. We'll be at 55% Hispanic and down in about a 30% uh, Anglo population, if I understand the numbers correctly. What do those changes portend for hospitals in terms of how you have to pivot in the direction of this demographic reality, inevitability? Well, you know, I, th I think that that's uh, an interesting question where healthcare and economics come together. I think that the state needs to invest in creating programs that ensure that you have uh, access to education so that you can change the demographics of communities today. In, our, uh, in Hidalgo County, you do have a large number of uninsured, almost 40%. Um, so you have um, you know, quite a big number there. One in three are Medicaid residents. So you have real payer mix challenges. Uh, you also have some interesting uh, complications in, in disease pathology. Such yeah, so are the, health, uh, the health challenges based on the composition of the population may not be what people in another community might say. Ex exactly, but I think right. you're going to see a lot just from, if, you see, if you're talking about the increase in number of, of minorities in Texas, you will see an increased number for diabetes, and that's one of the things that are addressed. We've created a very large and robust diabetes initiative that's partnered with both the Cleveland Clinic and Harvard University right. at our hospital to address that. But I think that Texas will need to have an increase in endocrinologists and diabetes management and, and preventative education to be able to address that, and we can make those changes now. Uh, but you do have that population that's in the middle. If you were to start today and treating everyone with preventative medicine to avoid them from getting diabetes or better managing, you still have about a 10-year, 15-year window of patients that it may be too late to fully address that issue. So you have to be able to plan for that. And do you have the capacity to deal with that right now? I think we're working towards it. We're very, I mean, we're committed to the idea that hopefully we could one day make a major contribution to curing diabetes. Um, how and when that's going to come, I hope it comes sooner rather than later. We have right. some great innovations, but I think it is a change. I think that it's going to have some changes overall. But it, as far as for Texas, I think it's, and the changing demographics, I think economics as well as investment uh, in 
in education and training will meet healthcare and help solve some right. of those problems. Uh, Colonel Massey, here we sit in the fourth largest city in the country, uh, moving to third largest. We're going to pass Chicago. Houston will pass Chicago soon and be the third largest city in the country. And an extraordinarily, maybe the most extraordinarily diverse city. Much of the demographic change, growth and composition change, you're feeling here. Absolutely. So how does that change the way you think about the hospitals that you run? Well, in terms of the demographic tide that's changing, we're there already. At Harris Health, 60% uh, of our patient population is Hispanic. 40% of the patients who we take care of uh, have a primary or secondary diagnosis of diabetes. And so it's, it's changing the focus of, of what we do and how we do it. Uh, there's the, the, the language disparity oftentimes that has to be addressed uh, in terms of patient education, uh, medication management, et cetera. So it, 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 is a, it is a major refocus in terms of how we address the population we serve. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Warner, Dallas is no slouch in the demographics department, yeah. obviously. You know, it may not be exactly where Houston is, but you're facing many of the same challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think for us, as we move towards caring for just what comes to us, but actually caring for a population of people, we have to be very diverse and very flexible because prevention and education are different for different populations of people. They're viewing it from a different lens. They may have a different set of medical problems, and we have to adapt to that and stay ahead of that because we're going to be held accountable more and right. more for so populations. How, so as a practical matter, in the last year since the Clements Hospital has been open, how have you addressed this question of the composition of the population? Yeah. So I think, you know, trying to bring families and friends into the conversation around care has been a big part of what we've done in the hospital and, and you've seen, you visit our facility. So we have yeah. a video conferencing, a patient engagement tool where you can actually uh, interact with families. So we, so if you come to the hospital, it's time to see the doctor, you know, with any device, without any particular software, you can remote in with in, in a HIPAA compliant way so that families, their friends, their providers, their primary care doctor can all be part of that conversation during rounds. We're able to videotape discharge interactions and, and actually make those available at times. So when you get home and you don't remember what the doctor said, you don't have to try to figure it out on your own. Yeah. But I think those types of engagement tools are going to be critical right. in terms of meeting the needs of different populations. It's the same thing we all do on our sm smartphones every day, um, right. right? We just need to apply that same interaction, that connectivity right. in medicine so we can connect them with the resources that are available to help them with their health. Stay with technology and pause that for one second. Uh, Dr. Sukin, what you're dealing with, you've already alluded to this, fast-growing suburbs, not necessarily the same specific demographic challenges as might be the case in the mm -hmm. Valley or in Houston, but at least a very fast-growing population. How do you pivot to deal with that as the pig moves through the snake? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think it's uh, several things. It's not only education and partnering with the community in terms of you know each community around Houston, uh, depending upon what suburb has its own set of challenges based on demographics yeah. and different health issues. But I also think this is where the changing of how our hospitals changing. And so I think when you look at the provider care team, obviously being diverse, but a provider care team in terms of looking at what is population health. Of course, we're all defining it. So having things like nurse navigators, having things in terms of those uh, post-discharge, um, so not only on the preventative side, but really post-discharge where we're having uh, follow-up phone calls and you're actually having, going, you know, having nurses go to the home and visit and really ensuring that um, the next steps of care are really followed through. And I think that beginning to do that kind of one-on-one -on -one education mm -hmm. That's where it's gonna. That, that's where we're headed, and that's how we're gonna change. And overall, I think population and culture, again, with this thought process of it's not just what happens in those four walls, but more importantly, how are we impacting what happens after, after. the event? And right. so, you know, we spend a lot of time on prevention. We're spending as much time on aftercare, and I think that it is. It does complete yeah. that whole that whole circle and, right. and beginning to, to change and, and make a difference. I love, Dr. Warner, you brought up the technology in the Clements Hospital. I did indeed tour the hospital not long after it opened. And what I walked away uh, with was this idea that medicine or the delivery of care, maybe better said, is being transformed by technology and the way the technology is transforming all of our lives. A hospital that's built today, as yours just was and as yours is being built, technology is going to be at the center. Right? So the expectations about what you get from a relationship with a hospital or with providers is totally changing on the consumer end. Absolutely. Right? And it's not only distance care. Right. We hear a lot about, well, you know, you don't have to be in the same room with your doctor, but it's almost all aspects of it. Right. No, I think it, it goes to every piece of our business. Um, yeah. Efficiency. I mean, we're, 
when we built our hospital, we learned as much from you know the Costco's of the world as we did from other healthcare. I'm not sure they, that's this is a good thing to be hearing. <laughs> <laughs> but really, they're moving items just like we're moving items. They track yeah. things. You know, they have to. They, and so we learned a lot from Texas Instruments, other folks. Where they're they may be moving chips, we're moving syringes. But uh, for us to run an efficient business, we have to learn from all different environments. Yeah. And you're right about the expectations. I mean. We're a connected world, and so right. people expect that same degree of connectivity in the hospital, and they expect to have you instantly available, just like right. most people are now via their phone for other things, right. and they expect that degree of customer service. But there's also the safety piece. I think we're also learning that there's a lot of ways to impact care in the hospital by bed alarms, so that someone who shouldn't get up gets right. up. Someone immediately to their cell phone is notified so they can sprint to the bedside and have that patient not get up and fall. And that, change, those, that changes processes inside the hospital. It makes us better. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Dr. Sue, can you use the phrase, there's an app for that earlier in this conversation? Mm -hmm. The reality is we give our credit card information to our phone mm -hmm. and to people who we interact with all the time. We're obviously willing to part with some of our privacy and to risk privacy in exchange for a larger reward. Presumably, that's one of the directions that healthcare will be going for all of us on an individual basis as well. As we turn over control of our medical records and our personal information, to our providers, we may want to have in return greater access to it through some of our devices, risk reward, yeah, right? Absolutely, I think it's bi-directional. I think we're seeing that for the first time. I mean, the fact that we take for granted of, um, it's no longer that a, a patient record is just only held by the provider yeah. and the physician, but now that you have access, and you actually have access to seeing what the lab report might right. say when it goes back. Is that bad for you on the provider end that we have more control over our own stuff? No, we don't see it as bad. It's it, not it, a turf it, issue for the providers. No, no. I think that that I think that that's really unleashing and kind of peeling back the onion. It's the same thing of why, you know, to be able to make an appointment and be able to do it online the same way that you're making a reservation for, to go to a restaurant. If you've got the ability to airline, do that, right, yeah. why can't we, um, in a non-emergent situation, we should be able, and that's really what we're pushing the envelope to yep. do, which isn't pushing the envelope if all these other industries right. are doing it. But it is a change in the culture and then a change in the relationship between hospitals sure. and the patients. Before we got a question from the audience, talk to me first, Colonel Massey and Mr. Rocha, about how technology has changed the way you do what you do. Well, I, I think it's, it's fundamental to what we've been talking about throughout the conversation, population health disease management. Technology is simply a facilitator to the, to the patient physician contract, if you will, or healthcare provider contract. It facilitates a meaningful dialogue so yeah. that I'm no longer, in, 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 as gr growing up, I, was, I would say that I was a passive participant in the healthcare experience with provider. The doctor prescribed, I paid attention, I followed through. It's become much more interactive, much more dynamic, and, and technology, as complicated and as daunting as it can seem to be sometimes, it is really the facilitator of that dialogue. And so I think it's a very positive thing in terms of where health. Do, do you believe the argument that because people have more access to information online, they think they can self-prescribe, all of a sudden everyone's a doctor? <laughs> I worry sometimes that we have access to too much information. I worry about the drug commercials on TV. That's what I worry about. That's what you worry about. Uh, Mr. Roach, I want to ask you about how technology has impacted what you do as a last question before we go to the audience, and add on to that the question of whether people in the communities you serve have as much access to technology as people in Houston and Dallas do. The digital divide affects our state in many ways, but in particular, the places where the social infrastructure spend has not been as much, and the Valley is a great example of that. Maybe people are not being able to avail themselves of the opportunity to, to wire up with their providers as much. I think that the digital divide is very, very present. I think there are challenges from our patients being able to fully, fully utilize uh, apps and different programs. However, that, uh, that divide is growing, and it's more generational, more than technology. There has been good investments. So I think as, as generations start to really catch on, you're seeing that, and now you see a lot of young uh, who accompany their parents or loved ones who go to the doctor who use the technology. But I think more than anything, how it has changed the way we do medicine is that medicine used to be very siloed. And integrated medicine was a nice concept, but it was impractical. I think technology has made that very practical, and patients are demanding it, whether it's through an app or when they show up to our hospital and say, I just saw your clinic, why don't you have my information? And I don't want to come back to another visit, you should be right. able to get it now. And why don't you know what my other doctor knows and specialists? So when you're creating that continuum of care and integration, I think yeah. that that is what technology has enabled is communication. We're all impatient. That's the lesson exactly. of this. Is that, all right, so we're going to use the balance of our time for questions from all of you. These are just great panelists. We could talk about this topic and more topics all day. 
Uh, raise your hand. We're going to walk microphones around. If you are yourself impatient, you can always use your outside voice. <laughs> but we'll try to walk you a microphone, <laughs> sir, right here. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the panel. It was a great conversation. My question is, you know, we talked about shortage of doctors. Yes. On the other hand, we're also hearing that technology is going to disrupt the need for doctors, things like IBM Watson, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Yes. Do you see that as an issue, and are hospitals prepared for that? Are hospitals prepared for that disruption? I love the idea of like driverless cars, driverless <laughs> hospitals, right? Maybe we don't need any people, right? Um, but I do think the idea, though, of an, to switch analogies, an Uber for healthcare, where there is some kind of fundamental disruption to the system, maybe we need, Dr. Warner, some reexamination of exactly how we do this business. Well, I think it's I think it's happening now, whether we want it or not, right? And so. And I think you know what we're seeing is an engaged patient is a better patient. And so whatever it takes to pre precipitate that level of engagement is going to be good for the industry. So yeah. I think physicians in particular are going to have to accept that some things that we've traditionally done, seeing people every time they have a question, is probably not what people are going to want. And so they may want to text me. They may want to email me. They may want to send, you know, for us to look at a shared database of their blood, brush, blood pressure together for me to comment on. So I think we've And you're good with that. I am personally. I'm not everybody's as good with it as I am, but I think we better be prepared for that. That's the world we live in, and honestly, if it engages patients, it's going to be better for all of us. The, the fact is, Dr. Sugan, we're in a world in which any filters between sort of point A and point B are, are breaking down before our eyes. We as citizens, individuals, civilians, all want more control to the people on the other end of the, of the conversation. So you okay getting a text in the middle of the night from a patient? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, while I am not a medical physician, I, I am married to a medical physician. The right. Are you okay with that, him getting a text? The answer is that yes. I mean, you have to appreciate, and I, I did a, um, you know, a talk last week, and I looked to a group of physicians, and I said, how many of you have pagers? And I couldn't believe that 10 hands still went up, but the reality is the pager went away. What century is it? A pager? Right? I mean, the pager went away. The right. patron went away, and they went away because most physicians, they transition, right, to right. the phone, and it's their same personal cell phone number. And so, again, it's access. I agree. Disruption is here. There is, there is definitely access. I think we are still challenged, which is the bigger policy question, of how do we build in ownership to employees to take ownership of their health and, and truly make it a priority. Um, I think any way to engage them is good. Does it come with a, its own? its own set of issues, the answer is yes, absolutely. Right, but if the process is made more intimate en route to right. people taking better control of their own situations, you're for that. Absolutely. Okay. Questions? Got one over there, sir, and then up in the front. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you very much, everyone on the panel. This has been very, very illuminating. Good. My question is one of sort of distilling everything down. What are the three most serious threats against the health systems here in Texas? Three most serious threats against the health system in Texas. Anybody, Mr. Roach, will let me ask I, you first. Sure. I think that one of the, the first and most serious threat is financing of our health care system. You know, unfortunately, it takes a lot of money to run our healthcare system, and we have some serious challenges, both at the state and federal level, our payer demographics, our economics, the way we engage the federal government in whatever will be the new system of healthcare is always the foremost challenge, because without it, you cannot have the specialists that you need to bring medicine. So I think that is Econo absolutely. Basic economics. Basic economics. Next thing is access. I think you will continue to have challenges with access. I think that disruption in the form of what we saw medicine in the past today is, is good to disrupt it, to make it more accessible. I think people want to be able to get medicine when they need it, and they want it to be available on every street corner. And we need to learn from other industries to make sure that we can bring the fundamentals of medicine and utilize where we're going in the future. And, and lastly, I think that it, it will be, uh, the, the challenge will be, um, you know, being able to have enough physicians. And so you have access in the form of getting to the providers, accessing your health care. And then the last one is just, is, is is just sheer manpower. Are there enough people to treat you once you get I there? I think with the retirement of nurses and physicians, we have some challenges. Uh, Colonel, quickly, what would be three big uh, uh, threats to the questioner's point? I love these kind of big questions. Lists are good. So give me your list of, th your list of three. Obesity, smoking, and driving a motorcycle without a helmet. Obesity, smoking, and driving a motorcycle. With That's a very old school answer, Colonel. That's good. Uh, Dr. Sukin, what are your three big threats? So access, enough providers, and um, I think from an actuarial perspective, I think all of us are looking at, uh, from a finance perspective, mm -hmm. 
um, higher rates um, because it, mm -hmm. the math doesn't work. Math doesn't work under the current system. Dr. Warner? So I would have said the exact same through the digital side, but I'll add a fourth. Um, okay. As Good. the academic up here, I think we're at, this is the best time ever to be a provider. Um, we are curing things that I, you know, when I, 22 years ago, in your I lifetime, finished, never would have imagined. never thought yeah. would be cured. Would be cured. It's a really wonderful time to be in healthcare and to be a provider in particular. But I also think that as budgets get squeezed, we could easily lose some of that momentum that we've enjoyed over the last 20 years about funding medical research. It's a big piece of what we do here. Texas is a great state for that. We've invested in it. But nationally, I, there is, is things, you know, as everybody's jockeying political priorities, um, we could easily lose a generation of, of new ideas if we're not careful. But you know, the best science needs money, and we have to keep that up as well. Excellent answer. Mr. Rosen. Sir. X7. Thank you all for being here. Great panel today. I have a technology question as well, but it's a more inward focused question. Inward focused. <laughs> yeah. Organizational. Uh, this may be outside voice time. <laughs> yes. How much are you looking, how much are you prioritized? Multiple systems, two microphones. So you're too, those now you're of you, too fisted. Th there those you of you who have, who have multiple systems uh, that you have to, how, how challenging is it to look at your data, and what, and how much of a hindrance is that to identifying the savings that are that you would like to identify? Let anybody jump on that. I, I can start. You know, data is, is something that we've used uh, exclusively to be able, not exclusively, primarily to be able to monitor how we're forecasting. We've actually been able to use it to have incredible savings that were generated in our hospital and help offset some of the financial challenges we've had. We had a campaign where we worked with different departments throughout the hospital and said, here's everything we're doing. How can we make it better? We had an employee challenge that gave us that. And we look at how we can improve medicine every day from financial forecasts. So I think that uh, data yeah. integration and technology to bring that data forward is very much a roadmap of how you can be more efficient in the future. Now, of course, doctors is relative to the folks up on it's relatively small operation, relatively small. You're you're running a behemoth, right? So, can you be as data focused and do what the questioner is asking? Use data to inform decision making as easily. The importance is to be able to leverage the data. Many systems, mine included, are awash in data. The question is, what do you do with it, and how do you leverage it? So, we yeah. struggle with that every day. We have a a totally uh, uh, electronic medical record, for example, uh, a $78 million investment in growing. And so we, we are able to generate mounds of data. As a matter of fact, what's scary now is now we know what we didn't know before. <laughs> and the question is, what, what do you do with the data and how do you, how right. do you leverage it? Good. Sir. Hi, I, I had a question. I know we've spent a lot of time today talking about the uninsured and the government um, funding of health care. But what about from a private payer perspective? and specifically value-based contracting. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like that's going to become more popular and more yeah. uh, of, of a wave of the future? What are your thoughts on how that? How do you feel about the private payer perspective? From a private payer perspective, value-based contracting, we've talked about the public side. What about the private side? Dr. Sugar. We would love it. Um, we're ready. We've been ready. Our, you know, as a health system uh, that's focused, and our, our number one focus is safety, quality, innovation, and service, we're, we hold all of our hospitals accountable to that, and I think we work very hard with the payers in wanting to uh, look at how we can contract um, truly and, and moving it uh, even more so from a pay for performance. And I think uh, talking about data, uh, we have 17,000 employees, and we're, we've done our own population health on our own employees and actually yep. can show outcomes. And we want to take that and work with our payers um, to be able uh, to, to show how we actually have improved the health status of our own population, no less um, everyone else. Good. Uh, let's have this be the last question right here. Ma'am. Since the Affordable Care Act is a law, do you ever foresee a time when someone comes to the emergency room or to the hospital and they don't have uh, health care that you refuse them? Since it is a law, you turn them in to the to the police. No, no, no. no. You could, could, so, could, so people will still be able to come yes. and, and right. get yes. care. Yes. So the the, the old system is essentially the current system, which is you show up, 
you have no means of getting health care, you need to be treated. We take take, you take, take care of them. There's a federal Absolutely. law, it's Emtala. 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 Emergency Emtala. Medicine Active Labor Act that requires hospitals to take care of patients who present in an emergent condition. No matter what the conditions under the Affordable Care Act or anything else may be, totally separate. they totally show up, separate law. We do you, you, you take them. That's right. On that charitable note, uh, why don't we uh, give a big hand to our great panelists, George Massey, Israel Rocha, Debbie Sukin, and John Warner. Thank you, Dr. Garson and team, for having us out here. Thank you all for coming. We hope to have you at one of our events again soon. Thanks so much.